Uh, we are going to pray. Um, it has been one of those interesting days. It seems like every time we're about to launch Red Life, that is when uh, the impending snow apocalypse comes. Uh, even though this one is still completely wimpy, and I don't think people need to be concerned at all. But uh, here we are, and so uh, we want to pray just for those who might still be on their way in. I assume we'll probably have a few latecomers on their way, uh, and just to pray for uh, what we would desire that God do here. Uh, the reality is, last week we talked about that, that if God doesn't do something at, at, at an event like this, if God is not going to work in hearts, then we may as well not, not even do this. Because uh, if this is based on any capacity, my ability, my, my, um, my teaching, Pastor Ron's teaching on the weeks that he's going to be up here sharing with you, is that me? Are we having problems already? We're just going to keep rolling because I hate holding that thing. Um, but if, if something's going to happen, it's going to be God that does it. It's not going to be... Uh, me is not going to be anyone's ability to convince us of anything. And so let's pray, and then we will jump in. <sighs> Father God, we, we, we just recognize the fact that as we look at the world around us, as we look at, at our culture, as we look at where, where things appear to be going, God, it seems as though it's getting darker every day. God, as we see the things that are happening in our schools, as we see the things that are happening just in relationships, families torn apart based on preferences or ideals or beliefs. God, it can be easy for us to lose faith, easy for us to lose hope. But God, we need to be a people who remember that you are on the throne, that, that you still reign and rule that no one will ever take your throne from you. God, that you are ultimately in charge of who is in charge. And so God, for each of us here now, um, God, convict us quickly that the purpose here is not for us to see the problem in culture. The purpose here is for us to see the problem in us. So God, we ask that you convict. We ask that you change hearts. And we ask that because of this, that we might all leave here looking more like Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So as I was kind of wrestling through what I was going to do for Red Life this time around, there's always a ton of topics. I think I figured it out, Abe. It is when I put my hand into my pocket and I hit the antenna. So I won't do that anymore. My shirt will. I won't. So help me. Pause. Stop. Start again. Okay. Um, a few weeks ago, I guess it was probably more than a few weeks ago now, uh, I preached through a section of Colossians chapter 2, and I started that time off reading through a, a, a state of theology survey that came up from Ligonier Ministries. And as I read through that, and then I ended up sharing it, a couple of things were true. One, uh, people were pretty shocked at the results. Two, um, the reality is, is I think there was a lot of fear. Uh, and then three, for me, the, the question came to, what are we going to do as the church, as God's people, as a people that should be marked by love and not by fear, to continue walking forward? as followers of Jesus. And, and so if you weren't here, I am going to share that again. If you were here, this is going to be like one minute of repeat for you, but I think it's helpful to set kind of some framework for why it's so important for us to understand that this, this culture war thing that people talk about isn't something that is just outside of us, but it's something that is very much inside of us. And so a few things to note from that survey. The first of them is that this was a survey that was based on evangelicals in the United States. Now, these were evangelical adults in the United States. And to be an evangelical, you had to be identified as a person who believes that the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe, which is us. You have to be a person who believes that it's very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. That, that's us. 
that you must believe that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. We believe that. And lastly, that only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. Once again, that's us. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the statistics that were on that survey. You can find the results for that at stateoftheology.com if you want to go look for yourself. The first statement that stuck out to me as I went through the results was this one, that God learns, so this is uh, evangelicals, you're supposed to say, yes, I agree with this, or no, I do not agree with this. 48% of evangelicals believe that God learns and adapts to different circumstances, meaning God does not know all things, that God is not all-powerful, and that God has to have a plan B. God adapts, meaning that God changes meaning he is not constant, which flies in the face of scriptures like Malachi 3.6, which says, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. 65% of evangelicals believe that everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God, which flies in the face of passages like Psalm 51.5, which says, I was born in sin, and at the very moment of conception within my mother's womb, I was sin. That happened. (laughs) Let's not do that. All right. Um, 56% of evangelicals believe that God accepts the worship of all religions. God accepts the worship of all religions. Let's think about that for a moment. Do all religions believe... That Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. No, they don't. Do all religions believe that only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation? No, they absolutely do not. And yet evangelicals in masses are agreeing that this is a thing. 56% of them. 43% of evangelicals polled agree that Jesus was a great teacher, but was not God. Disagreeing with texts like John 1.1 that says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That he, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and that everything that was created was created through him and for him, and there was nothing created that was not created through him. Flying in the face of of passages like Colossians 1 that says that Christ is preeminent before and above all things, first beyond anything else. Revelation 1 that talks about how he is the one who has always loved those who are his, the one who has chosen us from before creation, the almighty, omnipotent, holy one. 43%. of evangelicals who agreed to this statement to be an evangelical, that the Bible has the highest authority for what I believe, 26% of those people said that the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. And so these evangelicals who are saying the Bible is the ultimate authority for everything I believe, 26%, one-fourth of those people are also saying that they don't think that that thing that is their ultimate authority is completely true. And they would put it on the same level as things like the Book of Mormon, a pearl of great price, the Koran, or any other sacred writing that we might find in our world today. 38% of evangelicals agree that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion and it is not about objective truth. That it's a matter of personal opinion and is not about objective truth, implying that there could just be many truths and that the truth that is most important is your truth. This is obviously problematic. 37%, we're getting into dicey territory now, 37% of evangelicals agree that gender identity is a matter of choice. of evangelicals believe gender identity is a matter of choice, meaning God makes mistakes. Because God may have made you biologically male, 
But if you feel like you should be biologically female, then God must have created you wrong. And you would have done a better job. That scriptures like Isaiah chapter 46 that, that say this, I am God and there is none like me. I am God to whom will you liken to me and make me equal? I am the one who has declared the end from the beginning, the things not yet seen from the things that have been seen. I am God, and I will accomplish all of my purposes, and all of my plans shall come to pass. That sovereign God does not make mistakes, and he did not create you incorrectly. 28% of evangelicals believe and agree that the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior does not apply today. That scripture says something is sin, but that's not what it means. Or that scripture says something is sin, but it doesn't mean that now. It just meant it culturally then. Again, this is not true. But evangelicals, people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, are teaching these things. They're in churches, they're in Bible studies, they're in top-selling books. This is permeating everything. And so then for us, for for you and for me, and, 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 and so some of you have been alive, obviously, longer than I have, but... The reality is that for for most of us, unless this is the only thing that you've known, some of us are younger, and this is just, yeah, of course, that's just what I've been born into. Well, some of us have been alive long enough to see that there has been a significant shift that's taken place really in a very short period of years. And it's been a little bit confusing, and it's been a little bit frustrating, and, and we're left wondering, like, what happened And you hear questions like, what about the culture wars? Why didn't the church step in and stop that from happening? We need to fight in order to to have culture look this certain way for us. All the while missing the fact that there was never a culture war to begin with. Culture wars have never existed. And the reality is, is that it has been a very short window of time where what would be prominent in culture would be Christian morals and beliefs at the forefront. That that is not something that has been common throughout the history of the world, but if you were to look at what's going on within the church today and at believers, you would think that people are just losing their minds because, because something has been taken from them that was theirs. But the reality is, is if you look at the history of what's happened to God's people throughout the generations, prosperity and ease has never been the case for them. Cultural prominence has never been their place. Alex says here often when he's preaching on Sundays that that Christians historically have not done well when things are going good for them. But in fact, it's when there has been significant cultural pressure That is when you have seen the church explode in miraculous ways. See, the reality is is that it's really only been uh, since about 350 to 380 years uh, after the death of Christ that we've seen kind of this this brief window from, from about 380 AD until about 30 years ago where there was this season of what seemed like Christian prominence in the world. If you look at the events that happened after the death of Christ, one of them that Pastor Alex mentioned this past Sunday in AD 70 was when Rome decided that they were done with Christians, that this whole thing, this whole Jewish problem, this whole Jesus thing can't keep going, and that was when they destroyed the temple in AD 70. It was about 10 years earlier than that that Peter, Paul, and James were all put to death within about three years' time of one another. The church lost, effectively, its three primary heavy hitters all at once. Christians were being butchered. And you'll you'll see different things where people are saying, that's made up history. The whole idea of Christians being thrown to lions, that's made up, that's exaggerated. The problem that you run into is that that doesn't come from Christian historians. It comes from non-Christian historians 
one of them fairly prominent, his name is Herodotus, who, who comments that, that Christians were being put to death at an alarming rate for entertainment. And then something interesting starts happening. If you want to dig more into this yourself, you can go pick up a book by Rodney Stark, not a Christian, called The Rise of Christianity. The Rise of Christianity. And he gives a historical perspective of how the church actually grew and developed throughout history from the time of Christ until what we have today. That it's estimated that by around, I think, 300 AD is what he says, that there was uh, an estimated 37 million Christians in the Roman Empire. 37 million. It started with 12. In 30 AD, AD, Theodius named Christianity the official religion of Rome. The official religion of Rome. This was new. They went from putting Christians to death in the Colosseum to 380 years after the death of Christ. It is the official religion of the Roman Empire. By 392 AD, he had outlawed all pagan and non-Christian religions within the Roman Empire. This is what started the era that's been known historically as Christendom. And if you're like, wow, this is like history and kind of nerdy and I don't care about this, you should You should care about this because to see what God did in miraculous ways throughout the history of our world and of the church is incredible. Christendom carried with it some problems. Uh, Carried with it some problems like the Crusades and other things of that nature. But a lot of people would argue that Christendom actually carried through until about 20 to 30 years ago. You see, you talk about the Enlightenment and people want to go back to all of these famous philosophers from from generations ago, but but the reality is, is that the Enlightenment much more likely started probably just 30 to 40 years ago. Me being 34 means that would have happened within my lifetime. You see, what happened in that period of time is we went from up into the 50s and even into the 60s, there was these generations that would say, if you want to do well in life it would be good for you to be involved in the church. Sunday was an assumed day of rest for all people. That was kind of the standard status quo that that businesses often were not open on Sundays. Schools didn't hold church or sports practices or events on Sundays. If you wanted to do well in business, you were likely a member of the First Baptist or First Methodist Church in your town. Because people trusted that a person who would be a member of one of those churches likely would be a moral and upstanding human. And so I want to go to this Christian person with morals. I can't go to this pagan to have my muffler changed. Again, there's some flawed logic there. And with the 60s came a couple of movements which were problematic. Uh, Some of you lived through that. Uh, Some of us have seen movies. Regardless, we've all felt the effect and impact of that time. It was the time that kind of started, like I said, this this idea of the Enlightenment era, meaning we need to get away from the idea or thought of wonder of something greater than ourselves and start to look at the human being as not a soul, as not something created, but in fact, just meat on a stick, just an object a brain, and nothing else. Logic starts to reign supreme. There's no space in that thinking for the supernatural, only what can be explained easily on paper, or at least what we think can be explained. There's the rejection of the reality of a person's soul. There's an attack on creation, And there's an attack on eternity. The Enlightenment brought this thought. No one could truly have made all of these things. This has to be formed somehow on its own. It brought with it the idea that eternity can't be. 
that this life is all there is, and once you die, you just cease to exist. You need to live in the best possible way that you can now and experience everything that you can get your hands on. With the Enlightenment came the sexual revolution, the idea that my body should be used for my ultimate pleasure, and I should get as much pleasure as I possibly can. And so with that came the development of birth control, came a lot of problematic drugs in the 60s and 70s, not to say that they don't have some value or purpose, but what they were initially designed for did not carry a whole lot of wholesome goodness to them. See, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, the reality is is that we went from favor to presumed foolishness in about 30 years. We went from favor to foolishness in the eyes of the world in about 30 years. We've seen in that period of time the significant attack on marriage and human sexuality. We've seen in that time the significant attack in much more recent years on gender and God's design of a person. We've seen that now virtue and righteousness is not associated with godliness anymore, but now virtue and righteousness are assigned to those who have been offended. So if you have offended me, I am a victim now. And if you are a victim or can claim to be, you always win. And we've seen this new era that acceptance and affirmation of any and all lifestyles is a mandate. Otherwise, you're considered to be a bigot and a hateful abuser. You see, it's not enough to just say that you're okay with somebody doing what they want to do. And we'll talk about the reality of how foolish it is for us as believers to expect non-Christians to act like believers. We'll talk about that. But now, acceptance, tolerance is not enough. Tolerance used to be the big word. Now it is acceptance, affirmation, and celebration. You must not only accept, you must not only affirm, but in fact, you must celebrate a person's chosen lifestyle, otherwise you are an abuser. And they are by by standard status quo a victim. So what are we supposed to do? What do we do when it feels like the only thing we've ever known for a lot of us, which is, Christianity, following Christ as prominent within our culture, when the world seems like it's been turned upside down. And now instead of favor, we find ourselves being called fools. See, there's, there's a few responses that we can have. A few temptations. Temptation number one is to fight. Temptation number one is to fight. I'm looking at you, social media warriors. I'm looking at you, people who spend all of their time watching YouTube videos about why you should hate everybody else and commenting on them and arguing with people all day long. Getting in fights on Twitter with some random person named Big Dog that you don't even know. Big Dog might be a woman you don't know open hostility and division is a strong temptation for the believer because when we believe that this is true, which we do, we believe that there is in fact a moral standard that God has created for his world and there is, it can be really easy to think, well, why doesn't everybody just follow that then? So we fight and we divide from anybody who disagrees with us. But division doesn't just carry into what we believe about Scripture. Now division starts to carry into everything else. And so now if you don't believe what I believe, I cannot love you. I can't have anything to do with you. I must separate from you. Which becomes really problematic when you look at a text where we're being told that we need to be salt and light. 
a light in the darkness, salt that brings flavor and is noticeable. How do you do that if you just seclude yourself away from everybody? That's temptation one. Temptation two carries off of that. Since I'm going to separate from the people that I now disagree with and don't like anymore, I am also going to hide away. I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to do the ostrich, get my head in the dirt, get my butt in the air, and do the very best that I can not to engage with anyone on anything, not to ever stir up the waters, not to ever make any waves at all. If you try hard enough, nobody will know that you follow Christ to begin with. This is the very passive hidden Christian who might pray at meals because that's what they were taught when they were younger, but certainly not if there's somebody there that's not family. They might attend church, but they might have recently found out that church from home on the couch is a whole lot easier. But we certainly don't talk about it. And we certainly aren't going to share the gospel with other people. We certainly aren't going to let them know what we believe because that's going to put us in an uncomfortable position. And temptation number three, the most dangerous of all of them, is the temptation to compromise. The temptation to compromise. To say, yes, I believe that this is what's true. I believe that this is, in fact, the only true authority that we can have in our lives, and I desperately need this. I desperately need Jesus. But I don't like uncomfortable situations. And it kind of just seems unfair to me that people can't do with their life and their body and everything else, whatever it is that they would like to do with it. And you know what? I'm just going to compromise. And, and I'm going to support their lifestyle. And I'm going to be pro everything. And, and I, I'm, I really can't be a member of a church that's going to teach scripture in any faithful way. Because if I am, then people are going to associate me with these bigoted people. And so I'll find a church that's just very open and, and teaches that everything's okay. There's, there's never any real meat to it, but everybody's going to leave feeling really encouraged, believing that the most important thing is to live your best life now. And the reality is, is that before we even realize that we look far more like our culture than we do like Jesus. And the reality is, is that this isn't new. He said, this has been a short window of time where people who would say that they follow Jesus have found any kind of favor in society. And in fact, if you go through the Old Testament, what you'll find is God's people, the nation of Israel, constantly failing, first off, which is important. But second, constantly being taken over and oppressed and having their things taken. I think the temple, if I'm remembering correctly, was destroyed three separate times within the Old Testament alone. The God's people were brought into exile, into foreign lands that were not their own, surrounded with beliefs that were not theirs, forced to bow down to kings that they didn't choose. And yet God continued to be faithful. So what we're going to do for the rest of our time tonight, I'm actually going to give you a break a couple minutes early because there's just not going to really be a good spot to stop after this. We're going to give you guys 10 minutes right now. We're 35 in. Uh, get ready for a longer haul when you come back. We're going to dig into an important question. Are you walking in faithfulness or have you become compromised? So go ahead. Bathroom's right out there. Uh, if you want to yell at me already, I'll be up here, and uh, we'll kick off again at 6.45. All right, we are going to jump back in. Uh, with the remainder of our time tonight, we're going to, if we can, uh, take a look at two different examples that we see in the Old Testament. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I like stories. I, I like teaching through stories, and I learn really well through stories. And so when you have narratives like we have within the Old Testament that speak to exactly what we're going through, I think that that's a, a very good place to start. If you go to the book of Habakkuk, we're not going to turn there. We're going to turn to two other books in just a minute. Uh, there's this interesting story uh, of Habakkuk, this, this prophet in the nation of Israel, who is saying to God, God, our good king died. 
our good king who loved you and put mandates in place that would honor you, they died. And as soon as they died, the, t- the nation turned on its head. The nation has become pagan and idol worshipers. The, the nation is rebelling against everything that's good. God, do something. God, we need you to step into the story. We need you to intervene into what now is so clearly broken. God, punish the people who are rebelling against you. Punish the unrighteous. And God says, Habakkuk, I know. I already know. And don't worry, I have a plan. I'm sending the Chaldeans. If you don't know who they are, the Chaldeans is the same group of people that would also be known as the Babylonians, led by a very interesting king named Nebuchadnezzar. And then Habakkuk's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. See, God, I don't know that we're on the same page. See, I want you to use righteousness to judge the unrighteous. So the people that are in our nation, in the nation of Israel, that are being sinful, you need to punish them with your righteousness. But don't send somebody who's more unrighteous than we are to punish us for our unrighteousness. And God's plan reigns supreme. And we see that God does, in fact, send Babylon. God does, in fact, send Nebuchadnezzar. And you see this story pick up in Daniel chapter 1. So we're going to read a chunk of Daniel chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles with you tonight, I encourage you to bring one with you or a device that can open up to a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, come and talk to me. I would love to give you one. Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2 is very important. If you have a highlighter or a pen, this would be worth marking. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. That's the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that he himself, the king, ate, and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them new names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. The book of Daniel is interesting because oftentimes in the church, we, we look at the book of Daniel and we think about the story of Daniel in the lion's den and we remember the flannel graph from when we were kids or the Veggie Tales movie that showed Daniel snuggling with lions in a cave and it looked very warm and very cozy. But the story of Daniel is not so clean. It, it is not so cute. And it certainly was not fun for these people who were taken captive and exiled to a foreign, wicked land. See, Babylon was, was a little unique in, in how it handled taking over other nations. Babylon, when they would go in, unlike a lot of other empires, other empires would go in, they'd take over your land, and they'd say, now you worship our king, you worship our gods, your religion no longer exists, what you believe no longer exists, there is no place for you to be anything but what we are. 
Babylon worked a little different. Babylon would, would go into your land. They would take all of your stuff. They would take your best, your brightest, your smartest, your most attractive, your royalty, your nobles, and they would bring them and they would integrate them into their own culture. And they would almost become like fancy human trophies to the king. And, and they did it in a unique way where they said, and if you have your gods, you can keep them. You can keep worshiping them, that's fine, but you also need to worship ours. You also need to worship ours. And in the church, as we've cleaned up this story over time and made it cute and fun about people snuggling with lions, we've missed some really important realities. One... (laughs) Uh, that, that most often when we're talk to, talking about this, we talk about how you need to dare to be Daniel. You need to dare to be Daniel. Be like him. Look at how you've been pulled out of your good godly culture and you've been forced into oppression. You've been forced into this foreign thing that's not yours. You're, you're lost in a world gone mad. But then we actually need to evaluate what actually happened to Daniel and his friends. You see, Daniel and his friends were were part of the royal family or at least nobility in Judah. And as they were taken, there's some really significant things that happened to them. First, they were taken and given new names. They were given new names. Daniel becomes Belteshazzar. His new name is the name of a pagan god. Hananiah becomes Shadrach, which was the moon god in Babylon. Mishael becomes Meshach, which means who is greater than Aku, another of the Babylonian gods. And Azariah becomes Abednego, which means servant of Nego, who was another of the gods that they serve. And so the very first thing that that this Babylonian empire started to work on with these people who would be very influential within the Jewish people is start to change their identity. We need to change your name. We need to make you look like us. And so they changed their name. They put them into their schools. See, Babylon, you think about like ancient civilizations like this, and you're like, oh, Babylon, like they didn't have running water, they didn't have electricity. These guys probably just discovered fire and their little podunk villages where everything was powered by donkey. But the reality is, is that Babylon contained multiple of what are today considered the wonders of the world. Historians say that Babylon contained the largest library in the known world at this point in time. Their people were incredibly well-educated. But a lot of their emphasis was on things of the occult, magic, astrology, witchcraft. And when King Nebuchadnezzar grabbed these nobles from Jerusalem and brought them to his own kingdom and said, they must learn the things of my people, they must learn the ways of the Chaldeans, that was the schooling that they were put into. And where this becomes additionally not very VeggieTales friendly is when you understand what likely happened to these four men as soon as they arrived in Babylon, which is that it is very likely that they were castrated. And if you're here and you're below the age of 18 and you don't know what that means, your parents or Abe can explain it to you later. But we actually have a fair amount of evidence as you look at the text that this would have happened to these men. First and foremost, you see who it is that the person, or who is the person that they were reporting to. They reported to the chief of the eunuchs, a significant. Second, you look at their pedigree, that they were either from nobility or the direct royal family. They were men who were attractive, intelligent, charming, skilled in all ways of learning, fit, And kings don't like men like that around their harem and around their women. 
because what happens if, if they get any funny ideas? Or what happens if these very strong, very intelligent, very athletic, very charming, very powerful people have a testosterone-driven desire to revolt and fight against me? And so what would have been common in this time is for kings to have men of this kind castrated. This is not the Veggie Tales story. This was not on your flannel graph in Sunday school. This was not easy. You see, because I think we often look at a story like Daniel and, and we say, well, look at God just kind of kept giving him everything. God kept giving him everything. What you see next in the text is that the king offers them or says that they're supposed to eat and share of his own diet. And, and what does Daniel say? He, he goes to the chief of the eunuchs and he says, please, please, if, if you could just understand that these are things that we shouldn't be eating. We're not supposed to eat and drink in this way. Please, would you find it acceptable to give us a diet that's different of water and vegetables, which I do not understand at all, but, but that's the, the diet that they desired. And they're told no by the chief of the eunuchs. Why? Not because he didn't like them, because he fears for his life. No, I, I can't give you the diet that you want because if something happens, if you don't look strong, if you don't seem healthy and fit and look like everybody else, my head is on the line. And so Daniel goes to the next in charge, the one who actually was in charge of giving them their food and says, please, Please, I know that this is what is a thing in your culture. I know that this is what the king has commanded, but for us, this would be sin. Please, give us a 10-day window of time to try this diet of vegetables and water, and after 10 days, evaluate us, test us, and if we don't excel in every way, we will submit to whatever you desire. And what happens after 10 days, they are healthier, stronger, uh, better in coloring and everything else and everyone else that was there in their classes with them. And these four youths, as verse 17, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king commanded that they be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, the king spoke with them and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the enchanters in all of his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And so they go counter to what culture is demanding of them, and, and God blesses them in significant ways to the point where they excel so much in the things that they were supposed to be learning and understanding, which were not things about God, by the way. What were they learning and trying to understand? Things of the occult and astrology and of witchcraft, pagan religion and ideals. And God allowed them to excel at it. What's interesting is that you see throughout the rest of the story of Daniel is that they excelled at it, but they never adopted it for themselves. They didn't compromise. They stayed faithful. And you get to the story about how Nebuchadnezzar then uh, makes this giant golden statue and says that everyone in the land is supposed to bow down to it and to worship it. And Daniel's friends say, no, we can't do that. And the king is so enraged that he throws them into the fiery furnace. And what happens in their time of peril and trouble? God delivers them in a miraculous way. So that even the clothes that they're wearing don't even smell like smoke. But that people who threw them into the fire just by proximity to it died from the heat alone. We see that God gives Daniel the ability to not only interpret, but to tell King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was in chapter 2. And this doesn't just happen once in the book of Daniel, this happens twice. 
And it seems like time and time again, Daniel and his friends are faithful. They never seem to stumble. They never seem to mess up. God continues to deliver them from all of this peril in miraculous ways. We, we get to the time where there's a new king on the scene. There's the writing on the wall. Daniel interprets this writing for the king. There's a decree that goes out that you're not allowed to pray to anyone anymore other than the king's chosen gods. And Daniel continues to pray. He doesn't compromise. He refuses to give in to this. He's caught. He's thrown into the lion's den, once again miraculously saved and protected. But here's the problem. See, we have this incredible example of faithfulness and of God's time and time again deliverance. But, but what happens when you, you work and you try really hard to be faithful and in, instead of delivering you, God chooses to walk with you through your suffering? What if instead of paving the way for you to succeed in all of these ways like happened to Daniel and his friends, God instead sees fit to walk with you through it? You see, we're given the account of four men out of hundreds or thousands that would have been taken into exile in the same exact circumstance. But we don't know what happened to them. We don't know where they struggled with faithfulness. We don't know where they struggled with compromise. We don't know which of them stood up and said, no, I won't, that weren't delivered from their trial. And so for us as believers, where, where we would say we've seen God's deliverance, we've seen God intervene, we've seen God save, there's also times where we've seen that we need to endure a trial that's very difficult. And it can leave us wondering, is it, is it the right idea to stay faithful at all? Because it seems dangerous, and I seem exposed Interestingly enough, God saw fit to give us a parallel story. And so the nation of Israel is taken over by Babylon. And then as Daniel is there, and I, we just talked about the story of Daniel, the lion's den, cute, cuddly, protected. It is in that part of the story where a new kingdom comes on the scene. A king named Darius. And Darius was a king of another very, very big and important nation known as Persia. And Darius comes in and he wipes the floor with Babylon. He takes over all of Babylon's kingdom. Eventually he dies and the kingdom is then taken over by his son, Ahasuerus, or known better by his Greek name, Xerxes. That's with an X. If you're into uh, mythology or Greek lore at all, this would be the king who was famous for his remarkably embarrassing loss at the Battle of Thermopylae or the Battle of 300 against the Greeks. And his story is told in the book of Esther. Let's go ahead and open to Esther chapter 1. We're going to be moving real fast because I just realized what time it is. Esther chapter 1. Verse 1, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, for, for a point of reference for you, India to Ethiopia, reigning up into the Baltics, parts of Ukraine and Europe, this kingdom was massive on an earthly scale, absolutely massive. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. And while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. So this is like a six-month feast to me. Xerxes, as you read through this account, is a person whose wealth was so legendary, so significant, not because of his own things that he accomplished, because he inherited it from daddy, 
But Xerxes was so rich that it said that when his kingdom was eventually plundered, and they mentioned this here in Esther as well, that what the Greeks found in that kingdom were couches made of gold. Like, he didn't just have gold goblets and dishes and coins everywhere. He literally had couches that were fashioned out of gold where he would sit and recline, I'm assuming, in great discomfort. But he holds this feast for 180 days, and he invites all of the governors and nobles and wealthy people to come and to celebrate and to feast on his majesty, king of kings, Xerxes. But then he does something incredibly unique. Xerxes says, and now I will open up my feast and my power and my royalty to everyone else in the kingdom. And so the lowliest of peasants to the the beginning ranks in the military to everyone that you could see was invited to come to see the splendor and wonder that was Xerxes, his power, his wealth, his kingdom. And a very unique thing was made that they were able to come and that there was going to be I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the word off the top of my head. Basically, uh, there was no obligation to partake. The the idea is that if a king invited you to their party, uh, you did what the king said. So you ate the king's food, you drank the king's wine, you danced the king's dance, you laughed at the king's jokes, you participated or you died. But he said, there's none of that here. Just come and enjoy. My people will love me. My people will love me. And then Xerxes gets this idea after a a time in the party, and he he calls to his wife, Vashti, and and there's an implication in in the original language here that what she was being called to do was something that was going to be likely sexual and almost certainly humiliating. And she's done this. I mean, this party has been going on for over six months, so how often this was happening to her is unknown. But it seems that eventually she just kind of had it. She was just done. And so she said, no, I'm not doing that. And Xerxes was not happy about this. But the people who were really not happy about this was Xerxes' advisors, who said, "Uh uh-oh, his wife just disobeyed him. Uh, He told her what he wanted her to do, and she said, no. What happens if my wife hears about that? What happens if all of our wives hear about that? And suddenly, we have all of these women who think that they're empowered to make decisions for themselves. What a crazy idea. We need to squash this while we still can. And so they go to him and they say, King Xerxes, oh great, king of kings, we can't have it that anyone would refuse you. Nobody should say no to you, Xerxes. You should banish her. You should exile her away, put her on an island by herself, no longer in the kingdom, left to die. And then... Every woman will know their place. And Xerxes kind of likes that idea. Thinks that sounds pretty good. And so he does just that. He banishes her from the land, and then a decree goes out to the entire empire, all 126 provinces that were under the reign and rule of King Xerxes, that say that every man shall be the master of his own household and cannot be denied by anyone in his home. Can we see where this is problematic? Okay. Then Xerxes gets this new idea of pride. And he says, you know what? Daddy dearest had a little bit of trouble with the Greeks. He tried. He he went after them. You know, Darius was a great king after all. and, And he tried to take over this Greek nation, this Greek empire. But, you know, that was a little embarrassing. It didn't work so well for him. But I'm Xerxes the Great and Powerful. My armies are so incredible, my archers are so skilled and so numerous that the battle lore says that when they would fire off their arrows, that it would blot out the sun with darkness. And so Xerxes goes and he gathers his military together and he goes to take on the Greeks and suffers what is known as one of the most humiliating military defeats in history the Battle of 300, which, to be fair, chances of that actually having been 300 versus millions, very slim, but the victors write history, so we're just going with it. And so we have this battle that takes place, and Xerxes comes home broke, 
defeated, his military shattered, and a little ticked off. And so Xerxes is laying around his citadel in Susa, and he's drinking, and he's violent, and he's angry, and his advisors are getting concerned, and they say, "Uh uh-oh, what happens if he starts taking this out on me and on you? We need to give him a plan. And so they say, well, what does Xerxes love? Well, he loves wine, he loves food, he loves gold, and he loves women. And so they come up with this idea that again takes the cute little story of asparagus Esther winning a beauty pageant and being so charming and wonderful and throws it out the window, stomps on it for a long time and then throws it into a fire because that is not this story at all. In fact, what this story is is a story of slavery. It's a story of sex trafficking. It is a story of significant abuse and horrific using of people. See, Xerxes' advisors come to him with this idea, and they say, King Xerxes, what if you were to go around to all of the land which you reign and rule over, these 126 provinces from from India to Ethiopia and above, and we were to find all of the young, beautiful women in all of these lands and bring them here for a contest to see who would become your wife? Xerxes likes this idea, Xerxes likes this idea a lot for a couple of reasons. One, he likes women a lot. Two, everybody who would be laughing at a king who just had a humiliating defeat, well, they would be quite silent as he came and took away their daughters. And so Xerxes says, yes, let's do that very thing. And so they go and they take these young, beautiful women from all of these different lands and homes that are within the kingdom of King Xerxes. One of them is named Esther. And the thing that's interesting about Esther is that Esther lived with her cousin, uh, Mordecai. And Mordecai was somebody who was taken during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. He was taken from Jerusalem. He actually was an exile. And when we hear Mordecai, we often think, oh, this is, this is a very Jewish name. Mordecai is known for that. Mordecai is not a Jewish name. At least it wasn't at this point in time. It's a very Persian name. Mordecai was named after the Persian god Marduk. And so when the Jewish audience would be reading this book, which, by the way, the book of Esther mentions the name of God zero times, through the entire book. It mentions his plan, his sovereignty, his power, zero times. But when they would read this statement from Esther chapter two, there was a Jew named Mordecai living in Susa the citadel. They'd be reading this, there was a Jew with a Persian name living at the center of power of a conquering empire. He was living at Susa the citadel, which means he lived among the elite of Persia. And he took care of his cousin Hadassah, whom he named Esther. Esther is a Persian name after the god Ishtar or Astrid for the Persian Empire. And what's interesting is you go throughout the story of Esther, the horrific things that happen that we're not going to go into all of that detail here. First off, God is never mentioned. Second off, Mordecai and Esther never resist what's going on within this Persian empire or culture until Mordecai is a little ticked off that the person he's supposed to bow down to is an ancestor of the Amalekites. Haman the Agagite. See, Mordecai wasn't refusing to bow down based on the fact that this wasn't a right or holy thing to do. He was refusing to bow down based on who this man was. See, Esther and Mordecai were two Jews who were distinctly compromised. 
So much so that as Esther goes into this competition, eventually becomes queen of Persia, wife to Xerxes, never once is her ethnicity or where she comes from mentioned. As Mordecai specifically told her, don't bring it up. Don't tell them where you're from. Don't let them know that you're a Jew. It's dangerous. You need to just try your best to win. But there's some remarkable things that happen in this story. One, a people who are completely compromised, walking in rebellion, looking just like their culture around them, are miraculously saved by a holy God who they were not worshiping. You see, we have these two stories that, that are given as parallels of two people who are brought out of their home into captivity one who remained faithful and one who was compromised. One who continued to carry on what was faithful and right according to his God and one who adopted and walked in everything that was the Persian Empire. It's a story of how oftentimes we as people are very unfaithful. See, that, that, that's the reality, is that if you look at your life, and I know we're going a little bit over. I started five minutes late, so I get five extra minutes. That's how this works. If you look at your life, I would bet that you are more compromised than you would like to admit. I bet that you and I look more like our culture than we would care to say that we do. But what's beautiful about both of these stories is that neither one of them was ever dependent on me. <laughs> neither one of these stories that we see in the Old Testament were ever dependent on Daniel, his three friends, or Esther or Mordecai. They were dependent on God, the sovereign king, ruler, and redeemer. The God who we talked about from Malachi 3.6 at the beginning, that Malachi 3.6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. The God who's faithful when we're not faithful. The God who continues to walk with us when we do not try to walk with him. as we're going into now these next five weeks, this is a framework that's important for us to understand. One, we should not be surprised that our culture seems like it's shifting away from things that would be of God. Because that's how it's been through most of human history. Two, we should be willing to take a sober look at ourselves and pray to God that he would be revealing and convicting in our hearts the areas in which we have significantly compromised. Three, that God would help us to remain faithful in the face of opposition, difficulty, pain, trial, and struggle. And lastly, that my faithfulness and my ability to do this is significantly lacking, but God's isn't. We don't have to look at our world and our culture with fear and trepidation. We can look to our God with hope and trust in his sovereign power, plan, and will. Knowing that, yes, he may allow us to walk through trial, but he will never allow us to walk it alone. So we're going to have Pastor Ron talking to us about keeping faith for a lifetime. He's going to come and he's going to talk to us throughout this, this uh, season on how do we keep faith when we are faced with significant opposition, not just from outside of the church, but from inside. We're going to look at how do we walk in faithfulness in a job, in a situation where what would be far easier and honestly more profitable would be to walk in a way that is not godly at all. We're going to look at how do we walk with the tension of being taught things that go counter to what God's word says at school. 
and continue to walk forward in truth. So let's pray that God will help us to be a people who keep the faith in a faithless world. Pray with me. Father God, you are sovereign. God, we need to know and believe and be reminded that you are in charge of who's in charge, that you have sovereignly placed them there and have sovereignly placed us here. God, as we go throughout these next weeks, God, we, we need you. We need you to be convicting and reminding us of what's true and right and good. God, we need you to reveal areas in our lives where we are already compromised that we don't see. God, we're asking you to work. We need you to work. Please. Please, God. We pray this in your holy and your precious name. Amen.